All right, all right. Yes, we're hey. doing it now. Hey. hey, Claire, how's it going? Hello. Oh, it's great. Thank you. It's lovely yeah. to be with you, Juan Carlos. Yeah. Great thank to see you. you. For, yes, you too. Thank you for accepting and doing this together. And uh, thank you for the race team and the wonderful race community as well for inviting me to, to do this. This is the first time that I'm hosting yes, this event and with a great company today, the great um, Claire Crawford, a wonderful neuro language coach, uh, fellow neuro language coach, uh, coaching trainer. And we have a lot to discuss today. We'll be here today for just about 30 minutes. It's not gonna be the usual one hour live talk. So we decided to make this a little bit shorter, but it's gonna be packed with information, details and um, uh, information that I believe it can be beneficial for all the race community. Um, Claire, Claire is a wonderful uh, specialist and she's been in the language community for quite some time, but she had a very interesting transition because if I remember correctly, um, um, Claire started in a different arena in public relations and then also marketing, and then she smoothly transitioned. I hope smoothly, right? Um, yeah, Claire. Yeah, well, look, yeah. Looking back, looking back, I remember it as smooth. Okay, all right, yes, yes, yes. In that moment, maybe <laughs> it was a little bit harsh. But anyways, but she's gonna tell us about her own journey, how she started her transition into neural language coaching, those wonderful insights that she's had about the brain and perhaps she could share with us her next uh, steps. So welcome, Claire, to our session. How are you once again? I'm, I'm great. I'm great. I'm looking forward to it. So I'll, yes. I'll try not to speak too much. So <laughs> just... <laughs> no, it's okay. It's fine. It, this is, as, as we were saying before, this is all about you. No? <laughs> yes. So yes, okay. feel free to, to speak as much as you, you can. <laughs> Yes. All right. Wonderful. So let us start with something simple, the usual question. If you could tell us a little bit about your, your journey into the language uh, um, teaching, learning, slash learning uh, okay. field. How did you okay. start? So as you said, I started in, um, I was always interested in communication. Mm -hmm. um, so when I did my degree a very long time ago, it was in, it was a joint degree in film and literature because I was really interested at how, how we communicate meaning and how we make meaning. And I knew that could be done in, in words and the, by the voice, but I was curious about how we used image and music to create that. So that got me right back at 18 into studying cinema and because i loved cinema the first thing that i worked in was marketing cinemas and films um and that's where i started and i kind of worked for the first four or five years i was working of my career i was working in in really about in publicity for how we communicate, how we persuade people to go and see a film, how we persuade them to go to a specific cinema. Um, and I worked in that. And then I also worked um, because I was moving countries quite a lot. Um, I was also working for a design and events management company. And that's how I got into the public relations. Um, and what I found that I was doing a lot, I got, I got a little bit disillusioned in my mid twenties with marketing because sometimes you, at that point, you realize that there are some things that you don't really want to market because you don't believe in them as, mm -hmm. as products. Okay. Cinema, yes, but when you have to market a yogurt, for example, so not all yogurts are equal. So, um, I found myself thinking, okay, I'm not sure I want to, to do something which has a bit more value. And I went back to do my certificate in education, in secondary education, and fell in love with teaching. Mm -hmm. um, and so I worked in the UK as a teacher for about 13 years, working with secondary school children. Yeah. 
and also then working with teachers to at that point it was just the advent of smart technologies using smart boards um, and there was also a big interest in different teaching tools and thinking tools so i started to train teachers or to to facilitate courses for teachers um, and that's where i got really interested in teaching adults so then i moved into when i moved to france that was 2009 i moved into teaching adults i had a choice if i wanted to work in schools or work with adults and i chose working with adults in companies um so that's how i got into language coaching uh, and language teaching mm -hmm. as a second language Nice. Um, yeah. Very interesting, very interesting journey. And I always uh, think that most of us ed um, educators, language educators, first we become educators and then we need to transition into other arenas, entrepreneurship or learning other skills. So first mm -hmm. we develop this skill, this mindset of educators, but then we transition to something else. Mm -hmm. If I understood you correctly, in your case, the journey was uh, the opposite. You started in other areas like marketing, and then you uh, transition into this area. It's mm -hmm. into into yeah. educating, yeah, into yeah, educating, yes. So, mm -hmm. how my question is, how um, did those um, skills or knowledge in other areas help you in education? Um, it's I think. I think the marketing was a benefit. Mm -hmm. Working in marketing and public relations was really, really useful because mm -hmm. I was always focused on the end product of mm -hmm. the communication. Yeah. So focused on who, who was I trying to reach mm -hmm. and what I wanted them to either understand or do or feel as a result of the communication. Mm -hmm. And that was something that was really interesting when I went even into secondary education to find that that was often hidden in curriculums mm -hmm. and that there was a way of getting, because I was working with teenagers who had to study English because it was their, you know, it was a compulsory subject. They weren't always thrilled to be there. Mm -hmm. Um, but I was I was kind of evan evangelical about it. I wanted them to have control over their language. And this was a way that I could help them see the relevance of their language. And as you and I know, if we want to improve learning, it's got if we've if we want to learn efficiently, it has to be relevant to us. It has to be personal. Yeah. So yeah. I found that kind of where I was coming to to education and language learning was really beneficial right from the start, yeah, I think. Definitely. And communication is a wonderful skill that these days in the information age, most people need to need to develop, need to know. Yeah, especially uh, we educators need to develop further communication skills to these days. Uh, be there, out there, if you want to record videos or have a strong presence online, definitely mm. communications. I think mm. it's, it's a mm. wonderful, a wonderful mm. skill yes, to master. Yes, and not only teachers, but also our own clients, uh, coaches as, as well, of course. Yeah. And I, and I think that's a lovely point that you raised. We, we both talked a little bit about that, um, you know, when just, just in the warm up for this, we were talking yeah. about, you know, the impact of AI and suddenly we find ourselves, it feels sudden, uh, we find ourselves with these amazing resources to create communications. Yeah. But even now more than ever, I think we have to understand how, what, the impact of that communication is on on our audiences, on who mm -hmm. we're trying to reach. Um, because if we don't understand it, then we're not able to manage it. Yeah. And we become passengers in our own communication, which is is sad because I think mm -hmm. humans have got a lot to offer. 
yeah, yeah, we do. <laughs> yes, we do. Hmm. Wonderful. A lot of our um, participants in our course have openly confessed that when they take the course in neural language coaching, they are in a state of, of their lives when they want to rekindle their passion for teaching or mm -hmm. start anew mm -hmm. or to learn why it is that what they're doing is actually working because they have mm -hmm. the skills, mm -hmm. but they mm -hmm. don't know why it's working. Mm -hmm. um, what was the process like uh, for you into your, uh, uh, like uh, into knowing more about neural language coaching and taking that first? Um, okay, definitely. Mm -hmm. So um, I heard we, we trained, you and I both both trained in the same year in 2016. And I had just, um, I'd kind of discovered the impact of coaching a couple of years before. I've been involved in a, in a kind of a nutritional and um, health coaching program based in Canada and had found that really, really, that coaching relationship really, really interesting. And so I took a life coaching qualification in France, but was still thinking, well, you know, I still want to work with people, helping them develop their language and communication skills. So I wanted something a bit more, you've, you know, you've got the coaching relationship, which is mm -hmm. the accompaniment uh, and that relationship of equals, which I was really interested in. But then it was, well, how do we transfer knowledge about a language, how it works or how to, you know, approaches, ways to think about the learning. Um, and of course, that was a Google search. And that's how I found mm -hmm. neuro language coaching. Mm -hmm. Now, I must admit, when I joined and it was really, I was fascinated by the coaching part. I was convinced yep. by the coaching part. The neuroscience part was kind of, well, that's a scary word. Oh, okay. And I and I will say that I always felt a bit skeptical about how, how could we deliver language knowledge through coaching. Yeah. So I was skeptical. Yeah. But it's past <laughs> tense. It's past tense. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Speaking of the neuro part, that fancy, you know, prefix that uh, it's very popular these days. And um, what uh, have been some of the recent uh, insights that you you've had about perhaps the the brain that has uh, captured your your interest and your attention? Um, I think honestly, it's it's about for me, it's almost about rediscovering things and and looking at things that I've thought about in the past under a new lens. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing can be about, I think it was, it was really impactful to learn about, you know, the, the relationship between the conscious thinking brain, our prefrontal cortex mm -hmm. and the, the kind of the, the emotional brain, the parts of our that uh, that are respond of our brain that are responding to and our brain and our nervous system that are responding without us consciously knowing about them okay. um so i'm i'm really fascinated by that and i'm recently I, I was reading i love the fact that more and more we're seeing the links between ideas that were in psychology that that kind of in the neuroscientific studies more and more is kind of coming up it, as you said earlier it's kind of like well this is why we thought this we we believed that this worked but here's the science behind it this is something that we can measure with you know yeah. with an EEG or we can measure it with with M fMRI scans um so I find that I'm really fascinated at the moment with pain pathways and that idea of how that that can can be related to negative self-talk, that the way that we talk to ourselves is actually kind of strengthening neural pathways associated with pain. So we can actually make ourselves feel worse about something and block ourselves. So that for me is like, ooh, this is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it is. It is interesting. It, 
it may sound a little bit uh, cheesy these days to say that you need to maintain a positive language, positive words, affirmations every day. But now we know uh, science backs uh, this up that once you use positive words, the right circuits uh, light up that yeah. allow you, you know, to, to take action, right? But if you have a negative language on the other hand, yeah, the pain circuits, as you mentioned, also light up. And then uh, it's not convenient for us to remain there. The one thing that I'm really fascinated uh, about learning is uh, more and more about the subconscious brain. Mm, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned a little bit about the, the, the subconscious brain. And, and I have a very interesting anecdote that I always like to share. You already know <laughs> about it, but it, it fascinates me. And um, this idea that once you develop a strong connection towards something, an idea, even language, of course, you start to recognize in certain um, similarities or you find mm. similar things out there when you go out. And this story that uh, you mentioned that you, we were going to talk about sneakers today. As, as yeah. A little bit. yeah. And, and this story has to do because in, in one of my sessions, I noticed a basically a, a picture of some blue sneakers there and i immediately felt attracted uh, to it because it, they were for a popular brand uh, can i mention the brand now i'm not gonna mention i the think brand i now. think so but i'm but yeah. I'm, i think we should ask for commission for yeah them. exactly yeah. but i i see this this picture of this wonderful uh, brand and during that same day i had a conversation with uh, a couple of the participants in my course and they mentioned you. They mentioned you, you that you were gonna deliver the next advanced course. And I didn't know this. I didn't know about this. Um, it caught my attention. And then later that same day, I go to bed and I grab my phone and I check uh, your Instagram account just to see if there was some similarities or something uh, that uh, told you that you were gonna deliver. Told me that the you were gonna course. deliver the advanced mm -hmm. course. And the very first thing that I see is you wearing those, the same blue sneakers, right? And, oh my God, what is this? What is going on? Is this a law of attraction or there's something else? <laughs> right? And and yes, this is what uh, really captures my attention these days. How do these coincidences happen? Yeah? And this concept can also be applied with uh, with the language learning process, has that ever totally. happened to you? Yes. Uh, well, Claire, I've got, I've got two, you. I've got, I've got another, I've got another side to that sneaker story. Really? Yeah. I have another side Please. because, it, and it is fascinating. We we talk about it as the, the what's called the Jennifer Aniston principle that mm -hmm. that when we connect, we we can we, every person makes their own kind of um, pod of or or constellation of associations yeah and so actually with you i have an association of two mm -hmm. things an english bulldog <laughs> okay okay an english yeah. bulldog yeah and <laughs> also also sneakers from this famous brand associated mm -hmm. with basketball stars in the past because um I, we so we you and I probably met in 2018 when we were doing yeah. the coach training course, and in that year the conference for the the what is now the Neuro Heart Education Conference, mm -hmm. uh, the Neuro Heart Language uh, the Neuro Heart Education Conference um, was in Lisbon, and I remember that we had a trainers meeting afterwards, and you went Claire are you wearing red sneakers in that picture? <laughs> and I was, because I love these shoes. I have the blue ones are my weight training shoes. Yeah. And these were my new, my new red ones. Yeah. nice. And so I went, Hey, Juan Carlos likes the same type of sneakers as I do. <laughs> so I have you in my, in my associations, I have you with red sneakers. You have me with my blue sneakers. Yeah. Yeah, and I definitely. just find that really cool that each person's kind of like their constellation of associations is different, and that's super important to us because um, 
I think you mentioned you mentioned it too recently, looking at James Zool, um, who yeah. was saying that you know the more that he read about about um, neuroscience, the less he actually explained to learners, because he realised that in an explanation he's only giving he's only giving his side of things, not exactly. not the associations of the learner. Exactly. And thank you for reminding me about that as well. Yes, yes, it's it's very interesting. Yes, and it makes total total sense. You know, the way I teach coach something uh, is the way I do it, but that doesn't mean that my learners, my clients, understand it in the same way that I do. Mm, mm, and, mm. And, yeah, and yesterday uh, we were talking about this very briefly that... Uh, uh, this idea is, is not a complete thought yet, it's not fully complete, but this is how I see things that the more you know about something, the more you consider that people uh, may know just as much as you do. You know? So, mm -hmm. and, and I think this is what, um, uh, uh, well, not help us, but we, we lose track of, of things of how we teach when we do it many multiple times and we think that oh yeah if i explain it this way they will also understand it in the same way that i that mm. i al always teach it you know mm. share it yes so mm. it's a very interesting concept this um so going back to this point of the blue sneakers and this idea that emotions play a key role in learning and the question is how can we use the right emotions uh, for the learning process to be uh, more efficient in a way. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, when I did a little bit of uh, research on, on you, although we've uh, met uh, um, and we know each other for, mm -hmm. for some years, I'm, I saw on your profile the question that, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you, because sure. your profile says that uh, in any arena, in any field, the same question uh, kept uh, be rising to the surface in a way. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Without giving us way too many details about um, neuro language coaching and what <laughs> uh, makes neuro language coaching, how, in your opinion, do we learn uh, uh, the best, you no know, faster and more efficiently from your perspective? Um, ooh, okay. So, so I think. I th as we mentioned earlier, there's mm -hmm. there's that idea of it has to be something which has value for us. Okay. And right. that that seems like you're like oh well, thank you, Claire. You've just pointed out the the blatantly obvious. But so many times in in learning environments or in training <laughs> environments, um. There's there's a body of information that has to be given to the to the learner, presented to the learner, and and often because of curriculums and so on, that's a huge body of knowledge that we're pushing pushing and we're constrained by time. And actually, for for me, for that, just making the switch from a kind of a from that kind of process, that pedagogical process to a more open one of, okay, here's this information, what, what of this resonates? Or what is important for you to learn when you think about this topic or when you approach this topic? What do you need to know? Um, and what do you, what, what will you use it what how will you apply it so i think it very much that idea of it being of of value to the learner and that comes from the learner's position okay they're understanding the value of it so for educators we're trying to find a, a position where we can access so that they've got the possibility of seeing the value to them mm -hmm. um so that's one thing is the value. Mm -hmm. And I think it's then also about, yeah, that's personal value. And then it's about kind of helping them take ownership of that learning. 
to then say, OK, well, I see this as value. How best can I learn it? And one of the lovely things is that people, I know you have found it, you often can be surprised how aware learners are, are about how they learn. If you know what questions to ask them, you yeah. might be uncovering it with them, but they already have those tools. They already often know how they learn. So when you give them the freedom to go, OK, so this is something you want to learn. How do you want to learn it? It becomes really exciting. Yeah. For, for them yeah. and us, I think. Yeah, it's wonderful, wonderful. So asking the right questions can help them Yeah, uh, to have those aha moments, those eureka moments that allow them, that will allow them to in a way, uh, share with you how they learn best. Yeah, absolutely. Very, very absolutely. And you were talking yesterday about those lovely gamma flashes Ooh. of inspiration <laughs> of of the Eureka moments um, yeah. that are just they're just exciting to be around when you see someone get it. Yeah, very um, they light up. Yes, their even their posture changes, their faces light up. Yeah, definitely. Their yeah. cheeks get, get a little bit rosy. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, speaking of uh, learning, Claire, what is something that you're curious about learning yourself these days? I'm going to show you. You might be able to see it in the background behind okay. me. I have a I have a <laughs> mandolin. Ooh. And I've started, I, I haven't played any musical instruments for decades. Mm. Um, so I, I started, I last, last year, I got the, the chance to listen to, I was, I was playing wow. with a musical instrument. I got the chance to play a different musical instrument and it just fascinated me. And so I thought, well, okay, I want more of this in my life. And I, I bought myself a, um, a mandolin. So I'm yeah. learning to play that. And yeah. it's really interesting how the, the elements of lear language learning that, you know, and, and the processes that we use for language learning are very, very similar yep. to playing a musical instrument. Um, so I'm I'm loving that, and I'm also getting really really interested in in kind of the effect of music on the brain, yeah. um, listening listening to it and perform performing it. So that's an area that's exciting me at the moment. Yeah, it's uh, very interesting. I think you you hit the the nail on the head on that one. Yes, especially in, and you and I both know about flow states. And I think playing yeah. an instrument can lead you more uh, smoothly to a flow state. And, and I'm fascinated by it uh, as well. And, um, and that's my, an area that I'd like to actually go deeper into, into that. And perhaps I may have to learn how to play an instrument myself just to experience flow from a different perspective as well. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and even, even watching, you know, watching musicians or watching watching anyone do something, or just just watching people playing playing football, or it just is amazing where where we find that and those elements of flow where people are just completely absorbed in the activity. Wow. It's just yeah, amazing. Definitely. Yeah. And and the fact that we can also, as uh, language educators, neural language coaches, can can help our learners also access those flow states when it comes to using the target language as well yeah, it's a fascinating yeah. area yes so, yeah yeah yes the yeah. more relaxed comfortable they feel i suppose that can help them access those states yeah. totally and also back to that point again I'm, I'm on my hobby horse but when they also get a chance to to do something that they're already passionate about interested so uh, being able to run with a client who wants to talk about board games because they're passionate about board games or they're passionate about 
um, you know, passionate about running or they're just getting them talking about those things, their, their, their centers of interest is, you know, that opens us, gives us that possibility of accessing flow yeah, so that's... much, much more. Yes, yeah. yes, definitely. Claire, I want to thank you for your time, and uh, we need to do this again in the future. We do, yeah. we do. We <laughs> yes. see each other more. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. I, I know that we have a lot to, to discuss and to share with uh, the race mm. community as well. Yeah. So um, wait for another notification of me inviting you to a, <laughs> a new I would uh, I'd a new love event. to, I'd love to. And it was, it was a real pleasure. It was yeah. a real pleasure to, to get you. to talk to you, Juan Carlos. So thank, thank you. you. So where can people uh, find you online, Claire? Where can they follow uh, you? They can find me on LinkedIn. Um, mm -hmm. And the best way of finding me, there are a lot of Claire Crawfords in the world. Oh. <laughs> um, but if they join, if they follow race, if they follow the language coaching, they'll find me as one of the followers. And I'm happy to, you know, um, link with anybody on LinkedIn, or you'll find me on um, Instagram as, uh, and there's Jacob's, put put the name on there. No, um, you'll also find me on LinkedIn as um, clairelanguage.com. Okay, fantastic. Okay. Yeah, and, yeah. and look for those blue sneakers, everyone. You'll see that it's her. <laughs> you'll see them on Instagram. <laughs> They're there. I'll have, to, I'll have to get the red ones on there as Oh, well. yeah, nice, nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for your time, Claire, and it hopefully was we'll see you soon. Yes. It was a and pleasure. And thank you for the race community as well and the team great, as well. Great. See thank you soon. You bye much. bye. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye bye. All righty.